got it going now. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to the fourth and final session uh, with Dr. Al Condolucci. And I have to I'll apologize to Al because I think I've been saying Condolucci this whole time with a ch. And Al, we talked about this. And Al yes. said, uh, well, it's, when it's two C's, it's a ch sound. Typically, if it's one C, it's a s sound. So Condolucci. My name is Oli Bax from President and CEO of SC LifeWorks out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. We help people with developmental disabilities find work in the community. I'm greeting you from Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I know we have people joining us from across Canada, across many treaty territories, as well as unceded lands. Welcome, everyone. A big thank you to the Canadian Association for Supported Employment, or CASE, for funding our Innovation Lab project that allowed us to do this training and share it with you. And uh, welcome to our friends and colleagues joining us from the Canadian Association for Supported Employment, or CASE Innovation Lab Community Practice Partners, as well as our keen partners from Community Respite Services logging on before anyone else, I will point out. Kudos to you. Um, and just a note and a reminder to ensure you're muted unless you're asking a question. Though questions, just a reminder, if you have questions, just pop them in the chat uh, rather than unmuting and asking them. Pop them in the chat and Al will continue talking. Uh, Al will pause periodically and then we'll look at the questions in the chat and unpack what's happening there and then Al will continue just like we have the last three sessions. Um, Al has graciously allowed us to record these sessions once again. So as I have in the last three sessions, I'll make sure they're uploaded and available to you, you know, typically within 24 hours. So you can watch out for that. Al Condolucci has been an advocate and a catalyst for building community capacities, a leader in understanding social capital since 1970, Born and raised in a steel town, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of the proud penguins, still making his home in, on Condolucci Hill. Al has emerged as a, an international leader and consultant in human services and community issues. He speaks annually to international audiences, 15,000 people plus per year. He's written great books. You can find them at alcondolucci.com. They've won praises and awards for their thoughtful approach to culture and community, and they're used in many settings, including colleges and universities. Before we begin, um, you know, we've been sending out feedback forms after every session, and I wanted to read a comment and respond to it. I thought it was really interesting. The comment is, there's a gap between what Al talks about and where that is being practiced by organizations. I agree. I think he tries to speak to the directors of organizations who will be the ones who can do change. What I see is that in the audience, there are not many of them here, but more grassroots staff who have a small voice in the organization's practices. So I think that's a really astute observation. And I agree, I'd love for more leaders to be around the table because more organizations do have to work harder to operationalize what Al is talking about. That's why we keep on looping back to Al. But I do want to encourage you, if you are, you know, a boots in the ground worker of any kind, you know, whether you're a respite worker, a support worker, a job coach, an employment consultant, you know, if you're, if you're not like organizational leadership per se, you are in a great position to implement a lot of what Al is talking about. And I just, I am going to try to pull up a couple things um, on the screen just to quickly review with you. And Al will be welcome to chime in as well, of course. So one thing I want to remind you of, and you can loop back to, I think it's session number two, where we really reviewed this. You know, the four key steps to building social capital Anyone can run with these. Any 
boots on the ground grassroots worker can run with these. If you're working with someone, what are their areas of interest? You can do some mapping to figure out, you know, where do other people who share those affinities or interests gather? Where are they? You can find that out. Um, and then the third, you know, it says understanding the social infrastructure. Um, you know, how does that group operate? You know, who are the leaders? What is that group culture? What kind of holds that group together? And then find out who the gatekeeper is. And, you know, that gatekeeper will have a little bit more influence on that group than others. So if you can get in with the gatekeeper in introducing that person you support into that group, you're kind of leveraging the social capital that gatekeeper. They're more likely the others in that group are going to be more welcoming, welcoming more quickly for that person. So just a reminder, you, you have tools at your disposal and you can loop back to session two to review this and what I'll talk about to use that. Uh, the other, I'm going to sh share just a couple other quick things, not to take too much oxygen here. Um, bear with me. Another thing we talked about is community mapping in last week's session or session number three. You can find it in the YouTube uh, sessions that I've emailed about and the different kinds of mapping that you can do specifically for the person you happen to be supporting. And there's one more thing I want to show because Al, when you were talking about social mapping, I thought about some tools that we all have or most of us have at our disposal. I have at my disposal that I've never fully used or utilized. And I'm kind of excited about giving this a try. So I'm going to pull up one more example, if you will indulge me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have a Google account, a Gmail account. So, you know, Google Maps I can use. So you can build a My Map. And within my map, you can build layers. So if you can build as many layers into your map as possible. So sorry, I'll indulge and use our city of Winnipeg. I know that I or you know a few of us within our organization were mapping ind indigenous organization, you know, in terms of resources available to indigenous clients we happen to support. So I can map those out. I can click that check mark and those places will pop up because I've mapped them out. I can share that map with others who use it. In addition, I want to map indigenous businesses. What are indigenous owned businesses that, you know, might share an, a cultural affinity to the indigenous clients we support who also happen to have a disability? Well, I can start mapping those too, pull those up and map those using my map. So, you all have tools at your disposal that uh, that can make that work easy to use and easy to share for others. So anyways, long story short, you're a grassroots worker. You have tools at your disposal to operationalize and use what I was talking about. I'll stop talking. Give a warm Zoom welcome to Al. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Oli. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for coming back to our uh, our session today. And uh, having a little bit of network issues, and I'm not exactly sure why. So if there's some freezing that happens, uh, please bear with us. Um, Oli and I, when we were doing some preliminary stuff, um, you know, when, when I would freeze, uh, it would come back in a couple seconds. So um, we did try logging off and logging back on. And uh, so hopefully we won't have uh, network uh, issues. We'll do our best uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to move, move along with, uh, you know, hopefully with the, the technology helping us here. Um, also, Oli, um, I have just wanted to get uh, on my screen, uh, my slides are superimposed uh, with the um, 
you know, with the um, faces and, okay. Uh, so what do I need to do to be able to get my slides up uh, that, you know, the, the uh, gallery um, uh, and, and images of people are over top my, my slide deck. Oh, and okay. um, so well, I did have, I did share my slides, but I, I think you still have the capacity to share. I think it's just a matter of clicking share screen and, yeah, and tracking. Clicking, yeah, give it a whirl. It should work for you. Okay. Good. There Good. Go. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Oli, thank you. Uh, you know, let me just say a word uh, about the question that was raised um, after our session last week. And, and this comes up a lot. I do a lot of training um, all over. And a lot of times, you know, people sort of feel that, you know, these concepts are great, but, um, you know, my boss uh, is not here or our director is not here. And I don't know if they would let us do this or whatever the case might be. And maybe the presentation is better given to the leaders than to uh, begin to um, assimilate some of the concept, concepts. And I think that Oli's point is uh, that, that he's made a couple points that I think I want to underscore one of them is that um, you don't, you know, I mean, I think every organization that's represented on the call, we have 40 some people that are, that are on the call right now, um, have a, uh, they have an interest in disability. And I think every one of the organizations have a mission of trying to get people involved in community either employed, um, lifestyle issues, living in the community, transportation in the community. So I think that um, every uh, agency uh, already has that kind of a goal. And so the concepts that we're talking about, and I think Oli really nicely summarized those steps that can be inserted into the work that you do. But I think there's one more point that I want to I want to underscore, and that is that social capital and relationships um, is a universal topic. It's 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 a topic that affects all of us um, in all aspects of our life, uh, not just the work we do, but in our living life as you know, a member of community, right? So I think that these concepts have almost a universality uh, to them. I think that they are things that anyone can apply in their lives for their children, with themselves, uh, or in their work. So um, so I, I just really would like to encourage um, everyone who's on, on the call to think about how these topics that we've looked at, and we're going to end with this uh, today, um, can be utilized in what you do in your everyday work, in your everyday life. And, you know, this is the fourth uh, session. We started with a focus on um, uh, devaluation, social isolation, and loneliness. And we talked about how um, toxic uh, loneliness and isolation uh, can be to anyone. Uh, we also, if you remember, summarized in that session that loneliness and, and social isolation are on the rise around the world, not just for people with disabilities, but for any of us. And the pandemic, of course, was the coup de grace, if you will of loneliness and isolation where we were literally ordered to stay home and to not engage and to be cautious in our engagement. Um, so loneliness and isolation are, 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 they are lethal kinds of phenomena. We know 
that the the answer to loneliness and isolation uh, is relationships, right? It's the opposite of loneliness is having a relationship. Um, and so this notion of social capital that we examined in our second session is essentially the goal, right? But in, in some ways, it actually is the goal for all of us. This is not just a goal uh, around the disability agenda, but, but it's, a, it's really a goal for all of us. And the more relationships and the more vital the relationships are, the better the life outcomes are. Are, no matter who you are and no matter where you find yourself. Um, and so that second session, we focused in on social capital and it um, showed in the um, introduction. Um, there are four steps, right, to this notion of building social capital. The first step is identifying those affinities and those interests that can be uh, aligned with uh, other people in the community. And so we talked about a cultural profile. Um, I think we shared uh, some of those documents. We talked about how uh, literally uh, a discovery of um, what people are interested in is the, is, is the antecedent um, uh, task to relationship building. And this is also true, not just again, in the work we do in attempting to get folks jobs and community experiences and life lifestyles, folks with disabilities. But it's true for our families. It's true for us individually and certainly for our families. Uh, in fact, the four steps that Oli showed to kind of launch our session today um, is really, um, it's like parenting 101. If you happen to be a parent and you're raising children, your goal as a parent is that your son and daughter or son or daughter successfully enter adulthood with a job, a house, ride, friends, activities. That's your job as, as a parent. You, We want to raise children that will contribute. We want to raise children that will um, that will be assets. Uh, in their community, right? And we know that as a parent, it's almost it's almost coded in us that the way that children get is you know find success in community is by being successful in relationships, um, in relationships in school, in relationships in the neighborhood, and um, and so as parents, our job is to discover. Um, in our children, what might be the stepstones for them to build relationships in their life, right? Um, and so in a very similar way, just like we when we talked about the cultural profile and the work we do in trying to examine and, and sort of tease out the interest areas and the affinities and the passions that the men and women and children with disabilities that, that our agencies might support, we do the 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 same challenge unfolds for us as parents, right? So um, identifying what people like is the stepstone then to other people who like the same thing. Step three, which we covered last week, um, is the community mapping piece, right? So now we discover that uh, that uh, you know Al likes. Uh, um music and we uh, begin to say okay let's map the community and find out where there's music classes where there's music being celebrated where there's music being made or listened to right and then step three once we discover the places where that happens step three is our focus for today that is how does those communities that we uncovered last week, how do they behave? That's what social infrastructure is, is, is really all about. And so what I'd like to do is kind of get into um, this content 
on social infrastructure. And I'll go through some key things here. And as um, as I go through them, if there's any questions or comments, um, as Oli indicated in the, in the introduction, toss them into the chat room, because after we go through this first module of social infrastructure, defining it, kind of pulling some of the pieces out of it, we'll pause and we'll take some of those questions. Um, that'll then lead us to our second module. That second module will be, okay, now, so how do we utilize the things we discover about social infrastructure? How do we utilize them in helping the folks we serve or anybody that we're interested in get engaged and connected uh, to that community? Okay. So with that in mind, let's let's um let's start to go through some of this this uh, this content. You know, this entire training series has been about connecting, right? About people connecting and 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 people having an opportunity uh, for building uh, relationships and the authenticity of of a community engagement and 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 so this little word cloud sort of captures in an overview fashion what we've been looking at this entire training series um and we've also in this training series introduced this these these two approaches micro and macro right and we defined that a micro approach is something we do with individuals that we're supporting a macro uh, approach is what we do with the community, finding and, and analyzing community. And be, both of these together sort of intersect to create kind of a community engagement gestalt, right? Because there are some micro things that we're going to do. And we get a little further in our session today. I'm going to talk a lot about coaching, about preparation uh, for community. Um, and that's a bike road task, right? Community or, or, or coaching people to be, to understand the infrastructure. And that's a micro kind of a task. And so micro and macro work hand in glove uh, to a bigger community change. And all of this is done in the goal of building social capital, right? Building relationships that are meaningful and that facilitate um, people's success uh, in community. And so social infrastructure, here's a definition of it. And, and you know, th this is a relatively new concept. And in the human services um, uh, industry, if you will, there has not been a whole lot of exploration. And and I, I dug out for today, I dug out... Um, Really, one of the books that was most instructive to me um, as I've been on my own voyage in both understanding this whole notion of, of, of the elements of community. But this book is by uh, Eric Schleinberg, who's a sociologist uh, out of the University of Chicago. And the book is called Palaces for the People. Right? And this book came out in 2019. 2019, which was really the very first academic um, piece on understanding social infrastructure. Obviously, social infrastructure has been out there for a while, but Kleinenberg kind of put put a face to it. And um, and and when I when I heard Kleinenberg in an interview on National Public Radio, uh, I I was in my car, I was driving to a meeting. I pulled off the side of the road, got my notebook out, and started taking these copious notes because I was just so, I was it 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 just hit such a nerve um, as a missing piece for me in my own practice, and um, and and so I you know immediately before I even pulled my car back out onto the road toward my meeting, I you know I got on Amazon and ordered the book, um, and and devoured the book. I was it was just really, really juicy. And I'm going to share some of what Kleinenberg speaks to um, in his expose 
of uh, social infrastructure. But social infrastructure is not social capital. We don't want to make that mistake. We want to understand that it is the conditions around which social capital develops, right? So it it is the it is environmentally, it is a macro sort of piece of how the social capital uh, develops. And um, when social ca- when social infrastructure is strong, that actually makes building social capital easier. When social infrastructure is weak or is non-existent um, or is or is degraded, um, that makes building social capital harder. And and you know when you think about this, you know you we think about it both formally and informally, because the notion of social infrastructure is the is the conditions in which relationships can be nurtured and developed, and. You know, so we think about food, we think about, you know, uh, rituals, we think about patterns that people uh, take, we think about the places and the spaces where people can engage. Um, now, there, there's, there's been strong corroboration um, uh, between social capital and its... Uh, uh, its impact on on people's lives. We know that happiness and healthfulness and and uh, uh, achievement, even things like life expectancy, are facilitated with with the development of social capital. Study after study has been just convincing about that. In fact, one of the things, and I think I mentioned this maybe our second session, but one of the most fascinating pieces of research that's really accessible to any of us, it's not hardcore research um, that you find in scientific inquiry, but it's social research, was, was the efforts at development of blue zones. And you might remember a couple of weeks ago, I introduced the idea of blue zones and indicated to you that there are five blue zones in the world. And the blue zones are places where people live long, robust, healthy, and happy lives. And there's in the blue zones, there's less hospitalization, there's less prescription drugs, there's less dementia, there's less um, uh, heart disease. And, and how the blue zones were, were discovered was through a National Geographic uh, project that was conducted in 2009. And it was it was an effort to see if there was anything unique about the conditions in which people could live longer, better lives. And so National Geographic sent out a team of of uh, of social scientists to around the world to begin to look at, data, look at death certificates, look at hospitalizations, look at prescriptions written, look at um, uh, long-term care, and and a whole variety of of indicators. Um, And what they actually came up with was five areas around the world that actually people live longer and they live happier lives. And they they began to put these blue circles on the map uh, in you know on the map of the world, and that's how it became known as blue zones, right? Because they initially began to, in their research as they were going through all the data, begin to um, ferret out these these places and spaces. But there's only five of them, right? Uh, there's Sardinia, Italy. There's Icaria, uh, Greece. There's Okinawa, Japan. There's um, there's uh, Nicoya. Uh, Costa Rica, and then there's Loma Linda, California. And if you Google blue zones, if you just get a chance, uh, you'll you'll find all kinds of really interesting information about lessons learned in the social infrastructure of the blue zones. Um, the uh, uh, and there are four factors that have that have kind of risen to the top of all this research that are the the driving elements 
of 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 people living long and robust lives. And as you might mention, one of them, probably the most important one, is social capital. Uh, there's others, you know, diet, movement, purpose. Those are also uh, identified. But social capital is really uh, the key ingredient. Okay? Now, when you look at social infrastructure and you read things like, you know, academic explorations, of social capital or social infrastructure, there are two tracks that that um, uh, that have been identified. One is the what they call the technocratic track, and this is the kind of the stuff, uh, the political not 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 political, the physical systems and the stuff of community roads and bridges and sewage and water and you know the parking and, you know, building safety and, you know, those kinds of things that are the physical elements to a successful community uh, group. The second is civic, right? And that's the one we're going to focus on uh, in, 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 in our, our examination today. Um, this are, these are the clubs, groups, and associations and settings that exist in the community. So the technocratic sort of sets the table for the civic side to unfold. Okay? And so aspects of, 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 of social infrastructure include these things. Now, we covered some of this in our community mapping uh, section session last, last week. But these are, you know, public institutions or common space and civic groups and commercial places that exist in this thing we call community, huh? and um, and you know, and there's been interesting sort of corroboration to some of this that's really been fascinating. For example, uh, there's a book out called "The Great Good Places." It's written by a sociologist by the name of Ray Oldenburg, and in "The Great Good Places," Oldenburg um, suggests from a social analysis point of view, that, that people um, have three key places in their life. Um, the first is their home and where they live, their neighborhood. The second place is where they make a living, right? So where they work um, or where they, you know, trade time for money. And then the third place are what he calls the great good places. And these are, you know, the clubs, groups, associations, taverns, uh, cafes, uh, you know, places where people go, the third places in their life, where they, they where democracy unfolds. And what Oldenburg, you know, suggests in, you know, in, in, in his, his book, The Great Good Places, is that, that you know, we our first place, which is our home, um, is much is autocratic. Usually, it's mom and dad making the decisions about what happens uh, in the home, and and our workplace is also sort of autocratic in that you have a boss or a CEO or a supervisor who tells you what to do or somehow some way you know directs your um, your behavior and perspective. But in the third place, in the great good places, it's democratic. It's like you're on equal footing with other people that you engage with, right? That nobody is the boss of somebody else. And, and Oldenburg really makes a cogent uh, case for how important that is in in human development, where, you know, we have this democratic kind of opportunity to engage with people rather than this more autocratic one that happens in our first or second place. So though th those notions all relate to um, this, this phenomena of social infrastructure. Because social connection, as John Dewey reminded us, is based on the vitality and the depth of this direct intercourse between people, right? And, and democracy really 
begins in the community. So there are four elements of social infrastructure. Now we're getting a little bit into meat and potatoes, right? And um, and these four elements, I'm going to call them out separately, but let me overview them for you, um, are rituals, patterns, jargon, and memory. And these four pieces sort of constitute the conditions in which people engage and behave um, in the community. Rituals, let's get into that. Rituals are predictive behaviors, and every community, every group that has some regularity to it creates rituals. If people, in fact, that's one of the things that change that 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 differentiate a group from a culture, right? A culture has is is a group of people who have created some tradition, some expectation, and that happens. That gets played out in rituals. So every one of us on this call um, can think about places we go, and then the rituals that unfold and that you subscribe to. Um, probably the easiest one, the lowest hanging fruit here, is uh, places of worship or religious rituals, right? And, you know, and, and all of us have had some intersection with, you know, formalized religion, uh, going to a marriage ceremony or going to a you know, a funeral or, uh, you know, go, just going to church to celebrate, uh, going to synagogue or mosque, all of any of them, we've, we've had these experiences. And when you think about, um, about religious places, rituals are just dramatic, right? Um, I, I remember as a kid uh, going to church for the first time, my dad taking me, and and that experience was, you know, almost surrealistic in that, you know, we walked in the big doors, and, you know, you look in, it smelled different, and it was, you know, there were candles burning, and, uh, and, and, you know, there was a cup of water in the doorway, and my dad told me it was holy water and we were to dip our fingers in it and make these signs of religious significance right um and and all of those things lighting the menorah like you see in this picture are, are rituals that are deeply embedded in a culture right uh and the, even in your workplace, there are rituals. If you stop and you think about um, your orientation um, at your agency or at your organization, um, that that how you were introduced to the rituals of your company, your agency, and you know when to show up and where to go and how to look and when you have to go to a meeting and where you get the thing. I mean, all of that stuff has a ritualistic sort of piece to it. So rituals are really, really powerful. They're very obvious. Um, patterns are the social movements of people in a community. Okay? And never doubt the significance of, um, of patterning, that human beings do this. Probably when you first started working, at your current position, um, somebody who oriented you, showed you and told you about the rituals, but they also showed you, here's where you sit. This is where you sit and do your work, right? In this office or in this carol or in this bay, what th this is where you are that's your space and as for as long as you can remember you've had space that's yours right your bedroom when you were a kid um where you sat on the couch where you sat at the dinner table as you were growing up all of that you know was sort of prescribed 
Okay. And I mean, even and this is made fun of in, in, in contemporary, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 shows, uh, the big bang theory is a recent example. The, the TV show, the big bang theory, where, uh, where Sheldon Cooper has his seat on the couch and that's his seat and no one else can take that seat. Um, and that's, that's also true in your living room, you know, where, where, where if somebody takes your seat, you know, you, you know, you're a little bit annoyed at that, you know, that's where I sit, right? That kind of thing. Um, so patterns are really powerful in the community. So don't doubt that if you're trying to get somebody included in a community group and you show up at the meeting with the person you're supporting, don't, don't, you know, recognize very clearly that if people come on a regular basis to that community group, they have their, their, their space. They have their favorite spot where they go, where they sit. Um, in your staff meetings, when you have your staff meetings at your, at your agency and you gather, you know, where, your supervisor or the boss or the CEO or whoever the big enchilada is, you know where they're going to sit at the, at the board table or at the conference room. Uh, so patterns are really powerful and they exist in community. And, and if we don't factor that in there, when, when we make, when we begin to penetrate the newcomer into a community group, we can make a serious mistake. It could be a faux pas, sitting in the wrong spot, right? As simple as that sounds, that that is powerful in terms of somebody getting started being included in that group, okay? So don't discount um, these kinds of important factors. Jargon is another one. Jargon are the shared words that um, are used in that community group. And no matter what group, you know, you're in, there are words that make sense to that group about the specific topic that they're gathered around. Right? There are religious words, if you think in church, um, there, there, you know, uh, if you go to a sports bar, and, uh, you know, and, and you walk in and there's a hockey game and you say, hey, what inning is it? Right. Now that they don't use when you're watching hockey, you don't talk about innings. You do that when you're talking, um, you know, when you're watching baseball. Right. Innings are a specific jargon related to baseball. Right. Periods are jargon related to hockey. So quarters or jargon related to football, right? So, so the notion about the words that are used to, you know, engage um, are critical um, for us to know. Now, added in this jargon piece is um, small talk, right? Making small talk. And small talk is absolutely critical to someone's voyage in a community group getting started small talk happens all the time as an icebreaker to people coming together you talk about the weather you talk about the latest game you talk about the super bowl you talk about you know something that is that is law politics or whatever the case might be those kinds of things um, are starters. And for many of us on this call, uh, people we support have not had a whole lot of experience with small talk. They, they, they've not been in the social, um, you know, in, in the social scene um, to really be able to develop um, small talk skills. Right. And, you know, I was I was just in a uh, uh, I had to get some some papers copied in it, so I went to like a FedEx office and 
and they had some books there and there was a there was a little book you know that it that that was focused exactly on the how to make small talk right and then this was for sophisticated you know folks that uh, that you know go to meetings and you know run organizations and uh, how to make small talk so so the notion of small talk is is a cousin to the whole jargon um rubric here and in terms of people's engaging now many of us not many of us but some of us probably support people who are actually nonverbal right and and part of our challenge is trying to get folks engaged in community when in fact the communication ability may uh, be different right and and so you know there there therein lies some inventive or in, inventive i should say strategies that um we can begin to embrace in creating a passage for folks that are nonverbal but but remember it's you know it, 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 at the end of the day um you know if if you can't speak or or if speaking is an issue, uh, that doesn't necessarily preclude you from engaging with that group. Okay? Now, the, the fourth piece of this sort of overview of infrastructure stuff is memory. And every community group, any community group, has a start point. Right. And and that start point is how it was founded and who the founders were and what their intention was and and photographs and annual reports and newsletters that chronicle the group's continued progress over time. Right. Um, your family subscribes to memory. I remember when when we started our family, my wife and I. Um, my wife said, let's, let's develop a scrapbook for the kids. Right. And, and so we did, you know, she pulled together these scrapbooks, starting with photos of our kids from their sonogram picture, right. All the way, all the way to, you know, this kind of a picture that you see a group picture in first grade, um, and 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 the notion of you know our kids when they were grown up they loved those scrapbooks they used to look at them and then and, and remember when we went to Disney World and when we did this vacation and when we did that vacation and 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 and, and those things create a, a a depth if you will in in community you know many of the organizations that are on the call today. Um, our settlement. I was, I was on a call just earlier today with a organization, and and we were we were on a you know we were on a uh, a, a Teams a Microsoft Teams meeting, and one of the persons that was on the call behind them they had their their organization's name and and a big seventy, and they were celebrating their seventieth anniversary as an organization, right? And they had the banner out and. You know, there was this, you know, 70 years, man, oh, man, that's that's a long time, right? Um, and so clubs, groups, and associations also, even informal ones, have some kind of a sense of how did they start and who started them? What was the reason why they started? Why have they continued to meet even over this a period of time, even if they haven't done anything or produced something I'm, I'm a member of a of an organization called the social capital social um uh justice conversation group okay? and and it's a group we meet once a month uh and and it's a group of people from different walks of life who sort of join in and you know that you know there's no dues you know people just kind of show up uh, and and we talk about social justice in Pittsburgh and how we can how we can make Pittsburgh a more just a community and and not how we can make it a more just community by virtue of 
of doing something like having a program, but how just by being conscious and talking about who are people running for office and what do they believe in terms of justice or inclusion or hospitality. Um, and, and so this group has been going on for the last nine years, right? Hasn't, we haven't done anything in terms of producing something, but we have done is, you know, this notion of people reflecting and becoming better citizens, right? Which is, you know, a, a, a powerful product in and of itself. And at our, our meeting just a couple months ago, we, we went down memory lane and, and we tried, do you remember when we first started this? It was at a Panera's Cafe. You know, you remember he would join, Al was there, Oli was there. Do you remember that? We that call, we started it out because we were concerned about the United Way. And, and now here we are, nine years later, you know, with an evolved group of people. So memory matters. And recognize how important it is to celebrate, you know, what what started this off as we continue the journey. So the last point I want to make before we pause for questions that you might have um, is some of the recent uh, data on social capital. A lot of social capital was initially um, identified vis-a-vis um, -vis neighbors, neighborliness, and neighborhoods, right? And and the notion that you count on your neighbors and and neighbors are really important to a successful a community, right? And Robert Putnam, uh, really the, one of the popularizers of social capital as a construct, in his social capital benchmarking survey, asks actually asks questions of how many neighbors do you know, and have you ever been in a neighbor's home? And have neighbors ever been in your home, right? So, so he probes on that, and 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 it's an interesting phenomenon to think about because data is beginning to show that social capital is shifting from neighborliness to you know spending time with our friends um, as we become more transient both from a sense of physical transience as well as well as virtual transience um we've begun to develop friendships and social capital um it's beginning to sh change from the physicality of social capital which was more about neighbors than than about friends and um uh, so this you know, this kind of uh, stuff is being looked at in terms of trends and approaches. So with that being said, what I wanted to do was pause now. We're about 50 minutes, 55 minutes into um, our, our, our discussion today. Um, and I wanted to just see if there were any questions or comments on understanding what social infrastructure actually means and some of its component parts. So is there, it, it, let's, let, Oli, let me just kind of kick it over to you to see if there's anything in the chat room that we could, uh, that we could respond to. Sure, um, not a lot in the chat yet. Jill chimed in with small talk, can also typically include some form of sarcasm, metaphors, jokes, et cetera. That may be misunderstood that can make uh, someone feel even more confused or left out. Yeah. Yeah, small talk has, you know, I mean, it has variations. Uh, and and like anything else in community, it could be messy. There's no question. I mean, talk about political small talk. Um, you make a, you know, here in the United States where we're, you know, in the midst of uh, starting to deal with a presidential primary season um if you walk into a group and you do some small talk um about a particular candidate um uh, you could actually 
you know, people could get, you know, they could, they could, they could kick you out of the group, uh, um, depending again upon, you know, how people are polarized in, in terms of tribal, uh, tribalism. But, um, so, so small talk can be messy. Um, and the, you know, the recommendation on small talk is that you stay with kind of neutral topics, whether, I mean, that's not necessarily neutral, but everybody can commiserate about the weather or sports is another, uh, you know, another fairly safe small talk topic. Um, but I think that we can't deny the importance of small talk, that it, 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 it breaks the ice and it slowly begins to allow you to move into your, uh, you know, your topic uh, for why you've gathered. And, and, you know, there's been some really interesting, um, interesting research on small talk. I'm going to show you one, if I can, I may not be able to do this, um, based on the question, or at least the comment that was, that came out on, on small talk. Um, but, there's been research done on communication and that's really what small talk is. It's a, it's a type of communication that sort of shows, it shows up like this. Uh, and let me, I'm going to draw this and I'm going to hold it up to the screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it. Um, so. Okay. And this is time. Okay. So you can, you can analyze small talk using this kind of a graph. So this axis is intensity, and this abscissa is time, right? And you can plot communication this way. So you have a person that um, comes in to see you. They come into your office, and they want to see you about something, maybe maybe you're their boss or maybe you're their manager and they come in to see you and they they start this way as it relates to intensity they start with small talk right then they say hey did you see the game the jets game last night and you know what do you think of the weather and, and over time now this is this abscissa is time so the intensity starts to go up as the person feels safer, right? Now, what happens in communication um, is that often if somebody comes in to see you, the listener who's in their office, they start, and then here's what happens with them, right? So, so their intensity is high. You walk into their office, say, Oli, could I see you about something? Oli says, yeah, yeah, please sit down. And the person sits down. Oli's intensity is really high. He's ready to listen, right? The small talk starts here with lower intensity. As the small talk begins to become more intense, getting closer to the topic at hand, what usually happens with a listener is that they begin to lose interest. They begin to drift, right? So good communication is when intensity stays high over time, right? So that intensity actually stays high so that when the person is communicating the most important thing to you, the intensity of the listener is high, right? So small talk starts things off, and it's important that we understand it and that we, you know, begin to think about how might we coach people that we support in the small talk challenge? Okay, good. Oli, anything else? Any other comment or any other questions that that came up? Um, Yes, yeah, so a few more uh, comments. Kim chimes in with conversation starters. Maybe a good idea for the folk. Uh, we support for small talk when looking at jargon for groups. Yeah. Conversation starters yeah. are, that's a great example. 
because, um, you know, that, in fact, there's a little book that I told you about. I bought that little book. It's actually in my living room. Um, uh, and I've been making notes in it and really trying to understand how we might um, uh, help uh, with conversation starters and then actually practice role play and um and and give feedback uh, to to folks as they become a little bit more comfortable with that initial social navigation in a group where they don't know people that well or they haven't really uh, been to so that's a great point in terms of conversation starters yeah different context too um, you know, we just as an aside, will uh, especially in our project search uh, sites, will practice small talk in the context of the lunchroom, the office lunchroom, the elevator, or a big one, potluck. If there's an office potluck, right, right, uh, yeah. you could uh, really gain social capital or lose it quickly, depending on. How <laughs> how you proceed with that uh anyways um yeah. joy chimes in one has to be careful about sports with the super bowl and the swifties so i think she's <laughs> kind of joking but uh yeah when uh, politics kind of intersects with sports sometimes yeah. gets a little wonky Good point yeah. yeah that's about it in the chat i think okay. right now i don't think i'm missing Good. anything well, let's let's continue on, and then uh, we're going to be actually doing a little exercise um, a little bit further on. That'll take a couple minutes, and and so let's 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 press on, and you know, let's really look at um, some examples, if you will, of infrastructure um, changes because we know if you don't invest in the conditions in which a uh, community group. Uh, might be successful uh, that uh, that it will weaken the the group and and communities forward thinking communities understand that that's why there are investments made in things that will um, make the conditions for social capital better uh, in those communities because because they know that if 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 a community uh, deteriorates. Um, Bad things can happen, right? Crime and 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 you know social networks weaken. People don't want to go anymore or go less because they're uncomfortable or they feel unsafe. Um, distrust rises. So so community leaders, civic leaders, um, would do well to think about um, the, you know, what what investments are they making or what investments can be made to keep the social infrastructure strong. And let me give you some examples here um, in terms of some communities that have done some really interesting things, investing in, in the infrastructure uh, uh, to allow for more social capital to, to happen, right? Um, the New York City High Line, let me show you this actually, I have a picture here. Um, this is the High Line. It's in the Chelsea District in Manhattan. So if you've ever been to New York City, um, you know that New York City is just skyscraper after skyscraper. It's a huge city. It's it's really, really uh, uh, unwieldy. And um, in the Chelsea District, there was a platform where they had an elevated transit system there years ago. And that elevated transit system gave way to a subway that they put in under Chelsea, and they didn't need the elevated transit system anymore. And so it was just this deteriorating, um, ugly, you know, space in Chelsea. And so residents and, 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 and neighbors got together and they said, rather than tear it down, let's maybe see if we can do something with it. So they created a park, an elevated park. They got funding, you know, to do this, put in plants, benches, you know, umbrellas uh, for people to meet and have coffee and, and to get away from the hustle bustle of the street. And so this, this high line um, was 
was created. And I, when I went to see this, I was just so impressed with the, you know, the creativity of using and, and changing infrastructure because now they even have these, you know, covered areas where groups can meet, people can get together for lunch. Um, you know, folks can do a walk, a nice little walk through the, uh, uh, the the flora and the flana that that are there. So it's, you know, this is one investment in infrastructure. Here's another example. This is called the Beltline. It's in Atlanta, Georgia. And the Beltline essentially um, was an old rail line that was that wasn't used and it was out of and it became blighted and 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 so uh, the residents, um, you know, got together. They basically reclaimed that area, got some funding, created walkways and 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 benches and pavilions for people to sit and and gather. So it was an investment using something that had deteriorated uh, to positive use. This is the Anzac Bridge in uh, Sydney, Australia, that was also um re uh, you know rehabilitated if you will uh to be a, a place where folks could actually gather uh on the bridge and um again similar to the high line uh using it uh, in a different kind of way than the high line but making it connectable in that community so so that that in community um there are places you know that, that just stop and think about your own community. You know earlier, Oli brought up that Google Map, and he kind of showed that you can you can identify things in community. You can uh, you can begin to uh, uh, ferret them out and pull out various parts of them. But all communities have this kind of uh, these kind of possibilities, right? And and these spaces, libraries, community centers, rec centers, gardens, uh, all um, can be utilized uh, for the development of social capital and for for people to feel like there are places and spaces where they can go, where they can gather, uh, that are safe, that are easy to get to, uh, and that facilitate conversation, facilitate. Uh, connections. Now, we talked last week about community mapping, and in our in our efforts to you know think about community mapping, which is the third step, right? The uh, or excuse me, the second step. First step is discover uh, people's affinities. Second step is we discover matching community resources. Third step is we analyze them using a social infrastructure framework. And we get a better sense of how they operate, their rituals, their patterns, their the jargon they use, the history of that group or that that resource. So in the community mapping process, you could actually do a uh, you know a social infrastructure analysis of any of these things that are identified here, uh, how they operate, what they dress. What happens? Are there rituals? You know, what goes on in these kinds of settings? And so these community settings uh, become the, the, the point of connection uh, for, for, for all people. And, and so for us, those of us that are disability advocates that are interested in seeing folks with disabilities be a part of the conversation and a part of the celebration of community. Um, I wanted to start making some recommendations to you, to things that you, I think you might want to consider um, in, in, your, um, in, in, in your support. Of folks again, following those four steps, you sit with somebody, you discover that they, you know, they would really like to garden or they enjoy gardening at home. They'd like to do more gardening, right? So 
you step one you discover oh he likes the garden step two you begin to say is there any place in winnipeg where people who like to garden gather now oh, there's the winnipeg horticultural society okay great winnipeg horticultural society what do they do there how do they behave step three okay and and step three is basically analyzing you have to observe you have to go maybe read about it talk to people who go get a sense of how does it operate right do you pay dues how do you dress do you have to do you take a meal is there a speaker is there any antecedent stuff that i need to know in order to be successful there okay and then you're at step four and step four is identifying a gatekeeper who can help somebody navigate in. And what I mean by that is that if I'm supporting Oli and Oli's interested in um, gardening and I've discovered the, you know, the Winnipeg uh, gardening horticultural society, right. And I'm not a member of the, of the Winnipeg horticultural society then the only way Oli can truly get in there is when somebody already in there escorts him in or validates him or facilitate his um, uh, penetration into that new group, right? What I could do is, uh, you know, as a support person is I can get him there on time, try to get him there on time. I can maybe role play some things. I can coach him a bit on it. And a couple of things I might want to coach him around is, are these things. Number one, regularity. That if you want to be successful in any group, you got to be there. You got to go. And you got to respect um, that they're meeting at certain times and and be on time, right? And 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 then the second thing I could do is really begin to think about how can I better fit in? What can I what can I do to fit in? Um, how should I dress? Um, you know, what do people do? Um, is there anything I need to know ahead of time that's going to help me be successful in this group? And then when I go, participate, right? Be in, get involved. You know, I'm I'm of the yoke that if I join something, I'm going to, I'm going to not only join it and go, I want to become the president, right? I, I want to, I want to be active, right? I don't want to just show up. Uh, and, and that's true in life, by the way, for any of us in this, that if you want to be more successful, when you go to a place that you're, that you're connected to, participate, jump in, get involved, you know, roll your sleeves up, you know, be a doer. And rather than sit back and whine and moan and complain or, or, you know, just be some kind of a, you know, statue, um, participate, you know, you know, just find out what you're expected to do and do just a bit more and you'll be a superstar. You know, it, because mediocre, mediocrity is, unfortunately, sometimes the name of the game in community, that people go someplace, but they they really don't participate, right? Um, have a respect for the culture. This idea of cultural humility is a, uh, you know, is really a uh, diversity uh, issue, right? That oftentimes some cultures have had have had um, um, privilege. Some cultures have had, um, you know, uh, an easier way than other cultures, right? And and the notion here is to really try to be humble um, in a in a way that opens yourself up to the new culture that you're either engaging with or 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 connecting with in some way. So cultural humility is really a respect for the culture and the the rituals and the expectations that a group a community group has. Okay? Nurturing through food and camaraderie, right? I mean, 
there's nothing that's more powerful than eating with people. When you share a meal with people, it's almost, it's almost, it's like a communion. You know, you hear the word communion used theologically, but, but a communion is really kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a deepening of relationship. When you have a meal with somebody, it's more memorable to you than if you just had a meeting with them. So the notion of, of nurturing, um, uh, people um, bring donuts to the uh, to 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 the meeting. Um, you know uh, that that notion of food is such a powerful human elixir, right? And 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 so you know just kind of thinking about these things and and inserting them in some way, shape, or form. The camaraderie is you know the uh you know folks gathering over lunch at, at, you know at the lunch room where you work and, and you know go join in on that and 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 you know join in the conversation of what they're doing um when you do things like that you set the table for um you know being more valued and having an an easier um time building relationships um the final point here is that of the gatekeeper you know and this notion of the gatekeeper is uh is something i've talked about before i think some of you who know my work have heard me talk about the gatekeeper and uh, the gatekeeper just as a, from a definitional point of view is somebody already in that club you want to you want to get in or that club that you want to get somebody that you support in they're already a member of the Winnipeg Horticultural Society, right? And, and they are willing to welcome in a newcomer. Now, understand this about gatekeepers. They, they can be negative, too. You know, gatekeeper is just a phenomena. It's about opening gates and welcoming or closing gates and telling people we don't want you in building walls versus building, you know, gates. Um, so, so the notion uh, of the gatekeeper and especially the positive gatekeeper is something I'd like to segue into right now, because this, this idea of the gatekeeper is the way is the fastest way to soften to oh, wow. uh, get folks that you're supporting involved in community and you're not a member of that community, then you really can't be a gatekeeper. You can't be the gatekeeper. You got to find the gatekeeper. Okay? So finding the gatekeeper, you know, how do we how will we be able to identify a possible gatekeeper at the Winnipeg Horticultural Society who I might get only introduced to at some point, right? Now, just to appreciate, the theory behind gatekeeping is called social influence theory. Right? It's a it's a bona fide, you know, construct social construct and social influence theory is essentially when somebody who's a member of a group or a, you know a, a tribe um tries something or does something new that influences the other members to try it too like the early adopter concept where somebody adopts a new technology, for example. Uh, I remember when when Kindles first came out, right? My daughter bought me a Kindle for a Christmas gift. And this was before e-readers were really, you know, as 
as available as they are today. Um, and so I would be, I, you know, I'd take that Kindle because it was great. I was able, I didn't have to bring my books. I had all my books in the Kindle. I was, you know, when I would travel or go here, or go there, I just had one thing to carry rather than lots of things to carry. And, and uh, so I'd be in a bar, you know, you know, in an airport waiting for a flight and I'd be, you know, on my Kindle and somebody would be sitting there waiting for the flight too. And they say, well, excuse me, what, what is that? Right. Um, oh, it's, yeah, this is a Kindle. What, what is a Kindle? Let me show you how it works. Right. And um, so I was like an early adopter of e-readers and um, I never got paid for it. I should have been, I should have gotten paid by, by someone for this, but a uh, long story short, um, gatekeepers using social influence theory who are trying something new influence, especially if they're valued, they're, they influence other people to consider doing the same thing. Okay, Your mother knew about this concept. Do you remember your mother telling you to keep away from certain kids uh, because they were always in trouble? And you might get in trouble too. And they, you know, she even said something like, if they jump off the bridge, would you go? And you say, I don't know, mom. They look like they're having fun. To, I think I'm going, you know. But your mother understood social influence theory. And that's why she was telling you who to connect with and who not to connect with because she didn't want you to be influenced the wrong way. Okay? So social influence theory is powerful. And it plays in with this idea of the gatekeeper. And it gets us to this little exercise that we want to do. So what I wanted to ask you is if you had this document available, only send it out. If you can maybe see it, I'm showing it to you. I don't know if you can see it or not. It's called People Awareness. Do folks have this little document? Um, and what, what I'd like to do, it has, basically the document has 40 variables in two columns. So it has 10 variables here, 10 variables here, 10 and 10, right? So it has, it has 40 variables. And if, if you have the document, um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to read through it and I'd like you to check off. You see, it has, there's like these little check mark areas. I'd like you to check the item that matches your own personality or your, your own bent, how you are. Okay. Upper left column, uh, upper left column, precise, thorough, perfectionist, accurate, detailed, structured, cautious, meticulous, hates criticism, suspicious. Okay? That's just one category in the upper left side of the paper. Okay? Down below, in this second, says impatient, controlling, aggressive, demanding, argumentative, stubborn, impulsive, decisive, temperamental, bold. Okay? So if you're any of those things, check them off. Just, just put a little check mark next to them. If you think that defines you. Yeah. And then go to the next column, the column on the right side. Talkative, expressive, outgoing, entertaining, popular, sociable, spontaneous, good mixer, trusting, charming. Then the last 
the last segment on the right side, traditional, methodical, slow to change, amiable, worrier, patient, easygoing, predictable, diplomatic, holds back feelings. Okay. So you check off the items on either side. Now, what I'd like you to do is just total them up. How many check marks did you have in this left column? How many check marks did you have in this right column? Okay. So you have some totals there. Okay. Now, let me let me debrief if if you understood the challenge. Um, you should now have two totals, one at the bottom of the left side, one at the bottom of the right side of your document, of your paper, okay? So this little, this little test is a left brain, right brain exercise. Now, let me, let me explain this. The human brain has four parts to it. Well, it has more than that, but just for simplicity, has a frontal lobe right here where our foreheads are, has a occipital and brain stem back here in the back of our head. On each left side and right side, we have temporal lobes. And each part of the brain is responsible for different kinds of things, right? And, um, you know, for example, the frontal lobe is where we do our executive thinking. Our highest order thinking happens right here because this is the most recently developed part of our brain. Okay? The brain stem and the occipital lobe, they do more primal things like breathing, blinking, you know, that things you don't really have to think about. They're more reflect reflective, right? Uh, so that's in the back of the brain. It's more primal or your brain stem is. The temporal lobes, left and right, also have their own bent. For example, the left side of our brain is really the orderly side, structured side. It's very, it's more disciplined. It's um, more logical. The right side of our brain is uh, much more intuitive, more emotional more social, right? Um, so now on this little test, basically what it does is based on how many variables, for example, the items on the left side of the paper are left brain descriptors. So, so any of these begin to suggest that the left brain is a little more dominant. On the right side of the paper, these are right brain variables, and they speak to the dominance of the right side of your brain, right? Now, most people are more balanced and left brain, right brain are pretty balanced. Um, but for our purposes today, in thinking about gatekeepers, is to really think about the right side of the brain, because we know that with these kinds of variables, these variables that you see on this slide um, suggest uh, 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 a more of a willingness for people to take social risk. And that is to connect with somebody who might be different from them. These kind of people will do that more often than people who are more left-brained. Okay? So and now the key thing here is that these 10 items that you see are observable. You can actually observe them. If I made a trip to the Winnipeg Horticultural Society and I just went in and kind of looked around and you know wanted to know more about the society, I could see these kinds of things unfolding in terms of how people behaved outgoing talkative popular you know people are sociable entertaining you know people who mix well seemingly are really charming 
these kinds of things all you know point to right brain behaviors right um and so in some ways just observing helps you perhaps see somebody that you might approach and say you know i have a friend that's coming to join the horticultural society he's never been um, you know a member of a group like this before um i'm going to be bringing them over next time you guys meet but when when you come over would if you wouldn't mind i'd like to introduce you to him and would you would you be able to introduce him to some of the other members um that's it okay that's it no more no less all they could say is no or i'm sorry i won't be there or you know i feel uncomfortable doing that but more often, if it's a person like this that you have observed, they're probably going to say, of course, sure. Yeah, bring them. The more we, the merrier, right? That's more that will happen than, than the other side of the equation. So, so this notion of identifying gatekeepers becomes um, an important strategy in community building, right? So one, we discover that Oli really likes plants. Two, we find the horticultural society in, in you know in Winnipeg. Three, we go and check it out for the infrastructure. We want to know how they behave there, how they dress, what do they do. We check it out. Four, well maybe th maybe three and a half, we coach Oli on what to expect. And we, you know, maybe even role play when you go to a meeting, how do you make small talk and what do you do? We might do some preparation it would be three and a half. And then four, we find a gatekeeper. So when we bring Oli over to that experience, we introduce him to the gatekeeper. We still hang in there to support Oli to, you know, be there to help out if Oli needs help in the bathroom or needs some help you know, with a meal or whatever. We're still there for that. We don't expect the gatekeeper to do that. But what we hope the gatekeeper will do is not just introduce Oli to some other people, but to validate him so that his value begins to go up in the eyes of the other members. Okay? So that's the concept in a nutshell. Enlisting gatekeepers brings a value juxtaposition into play, which is a really important step in building social capital. So what I'd like to do is pause um, for some open conversation about infrastructure, about um, the elements of infrastructure, and then about some strategies for really helping people engage more successfully and in the process, hopefully build relationships or start the process of building relationships. Okay. So Oli, let me, let me do this. Um, let me just close this out. Where you are shapes who you will be. Eric Kleinenberg, Palaces for the People, was the book. Oh, Macron, let me let me just let me just finish with this. The structure of belonging, right? This is from Peter Block, and I might have mentioned Peter Block to you in the community mapping session. Block wrote a book called uh, "Belonging to Community." Peter Block, great book for you to, 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 to try to track down. Just Google Peter Block. Take a look at some of his recommendations in terms of creating greater possibilities of belonging. But this is just a little passage from, a little passage from the book. Um, the need to create a structure of belonging grows out of the isolated nature of our lives, our institutions, our communities. The absence of belonging is so widespread 
um, that it seems like we are living in an age of isolation. Ironically, we talk about how small the world has become. The cost of our detachment and disconnection is not only our isolation and our loneliness, uh, but that there are so many people in our communities whose gifts remain in the margins. Community offers the promise of belonging and calls us to acknowledge, um, you know, our interdependence. To belong is an act of, as an investor, an owner, a creator of the place that we call community. So this is Peter Block on community. Um, and this is my contact information. And I always like to leave you with this. Um, so that you, if you have questions or something further down the track that you want to talk to me about, these are ways to get in touch with me on my email address, um, um, which is just my name, um, that, that, that's from my website. So, um, so Ollie, what I'm going to do is stop sharing, open this up, uh, open the matrix up and then see what's in the chat room, if anything. And then any open questions that folks might have on infrastructure and ways of uh, strategies for, for using infrastructure uh, to build community. So let me stop sharing. Sure. Uh, there are a few comments and just it goes back to a, a few things you said earlier. Joy chimes in with food is a very important part of building relationships. It goes back to the amygdala is that how you well, say joy's it? right that uh, food is just you know such such a uh, a powerful ingredient and and you know uh, the, the, there's the joy in celebrating with somebody that you're that you're having a coffee with or or you know a beer with so absolutely she says uh yep sharing food is one of the oldest pieces to determining a, a functioning society and uh, yes, you did explain it well, Joy. Don't question yourself. <laughs> um, well, there was a comment. I'd been sharing the links to your documents uh, via OneDrive because some of the files were larger, especially the PowerPoint. But then when people just jump onto the OneDrive, they're putting in their, their comments and uh, everyone else can see them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so download those documents before you get them <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea uh, rick i ha had a couple comments or questions i'm not sure if they're rhetorical uh what if you are predictable but other people have trouble predicting what you will do even if it is consistent what if you are traditional but not the same as how yeah. the main herd perceives that yeah, you know, I'm I'm not exactly sure I understand exactly what Rich means in the comment, um, because predictability is not necessarily, you know, a bad thing, um, and all of us have certain features. Um, uh, oh, just asking how to answer the questionnaire. Okay. Okay. Um, on predictability. Yes. Okay, I, I I get the context now. Thanks, Rick. Um, you know the each of these um, these things are um, you know are are interesting because some some of them you you might not be sure. Um, you know, do you fit in in some of these? Maybe in certain situations you're you're that way. Um, or in, you know, not all the time. Uh, and so when you do an exercise like this, you know, usually they want you to disregard, like, for example, impatience, right? That's one of the, one of the big ones, impatient. And all of us, any of us on this call uh, have been impatient with things. If they lose your luggage at the airport, you get impatient, right? But it's the situation that drives um, the impatience. So it, you, what we really want people to do is just sort of ferret out situational behaviors with what typically unfolds for you 
in your daily life. And now there are some people that know they're highly impatient people, no matter what, you know, they're, they're at a red light. The minute the light turns green, they hit the horn uh, for the guy in front of them to, to um, that, that kind of person who's just, who's just naturally impatient would check impatient, but situationally, I mean, if something has really um, made you angry or impatient, but it was the situation. You're not like that all the time. And you're not, you know, you so, so you want to, you want to, you know, on a, on an inventory like this, you want to, you know, just take those situational things off the table and think more about, uh, about how you typically uh, behave. Any other questions, Oli, there, or any other comments that are in the chat room? Uh, none, I, I, none on here. You know, I'm curious if people have really great examples of, you know, where they've been able to connect into or connect people they serve with great social infrastructure. I, I know that one thing that we have been doing for a couple of years is uh, people we support job seekers or people who have jobs and just looking for other things to do. Um, we've connected them, our Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce meets monthly for luncheons. And so uh, they're ambassadors for the Chamber of Commerce. So they're greeting people as they come or pointing to people to where they can find different things they need. And uh, so we're trying to, I guess, part of what we're trying to do is we've identified that social infrastructure and uh, weave people in and uh, of course well, we're you know, always, Oli, we, go ahead yeah. let me just let me just piggyback a bit on that because i think that um you know you mentioned the chamber of commerce and and or fraternal groups that are out there groups like uh, kiwanas and elks and eagles and you know there there's various names for for these fraternal groups but fraternal groups are, are almost desperate for members, right? That they that they um, really struggle. I'm, I you know I did a keynote uh, a couple of years ago at an at an international Kiwanis um, conference, and um, talking about social capital, but also sort of I'm sort of shifting it to say. Geez, the fraternals are really looking for membership and not just membership, but people who will come in and help them with their agenda. Their agenda might be to raise money or to do this or do that. We support people who would love to belong to something like the Kiwanis, right? So it's almost like, how can we get these two pieces matched up? You know, there are people who just love, want to be involved. They, they're, 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 they're dying to help uh, their community. And we have a group that's screaming, please help us. So how do we, how do we fuel some of that and think about some of those other groups that are out there looking for membership and, you know, really soliciting uh, for people to come and join them in their cause? That's low hanging fruit. That that should that should be one of the easiest things that we can do. It's it's far different than trying to help somebody, you know, I don't know, join the horticultural society, for example. Um, good. Anything else in the Great chat sense. room or anything else that people have indicated during the course of our session before we open it up to more spontaneous uh, questions that might be on people's minds about anything that we've talked about from the first session all the way to today. Um, so we just kind of open and ended. We tried to build in a little bit more time because, because, you know, this series, even though each of these sessions uh, stand, uh, they stand on their own, um, but there is this relationship between them. And so um, we wanted to give a little bit more time for people maybe to, weigh in or 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 ask some questions in in relationship to all four sessions that's pretty much it for the chat it's been a little okay. bit quieter on the chat front so 
Great. Looks like we're open for the spontaneous piece. So we have, uh, you know, in terms of open-ended, um, people could raise their hand if they have any questions. Is there anything on your mind at all that might relate or that, you know, even a comment, if you've done this or tried it and it hasn't worked, or if you di tried it and it has worked, um, a testimonial would love love to hear hear your thoughts on it. Okay. We don't want to twist any arms. Um, so, you know, if there's, you know, no further questions that folks have, I think we can begin to wrap up and get you guys off a little bit earlier, get you um, on, into your day uh, um, uh, sooner. So, Oli, uh, I just want to end by thanking you. Uh, oh, we have a question. Rather than committing to a group, which would be difficult for a young woman uh, I do respite with. Oops, I didn't. I, I lost the last part of the question. You see the oh, question, Oli? I do. Yep. Rather than committing to a group, which would be difficult for a young woman to do respite with, I search on the Winnipeg for free website and then attend community events with her to spark some social connections. That's a great idea. That's a fantastic idea. And and there are there are things like that out there. Um, you know, I I, I think I mentioned um they uh, oh here's there's a good point that Joy's making. If we end the recording, folks might, you know, might be interested in raising some issues, Oli. So I'm fine 